Welcome to Business Pulse Talk Radio, the heartbeat of business. I'm your host, Michael Brett. Today, we're going to be talking about Kemp, hemp and cannabis. Uh, maybe I should have some loosen my tongue up. Uh, the last couple of shows, we've been talking about uh, alcohol. Today, it's going to be on cannabis and hemp. And we have a very special guest with us today, a longtime friend of mine for over 20 years, Tony Nick. We're going to be talking about uh, his company, which is, if I get it correct, Hemp Up of San Diego. Um, and this is uh, uh, Business Pulse Talk Radio. I'm your host, Mike Brett. Tony, welcome. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> Always an honor to be here. It's good to see you. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time. Okay, um, what is uh, Hemp Hub of San Diego? Okay, so Hemp Hub <clears throat> essentially is a company that is uh, a go-to company between the farmers that are growing the hemp, CBD specifically, and extracting it. And then what we are is we're the provider to the dispensaries and the end user. So essentially what we're doing is we're helping the farmers get their product out there. Uh, currently, Hemp Hut has three locations and three farms that we're dealing with, one in uh, southern Oregon, here in California near San Diego, and then also in uh, Colorado Springs. So the farmers are concentrating on growing the uh, hemp product, and then you're helping them actually commercialize it and get, get that product to in the hands of the consumer? Right, exactly. So let's, <clears throat> let's, let's break it down a little bit more. What's happening is the farmers, once they grow the product, they grow the hemp plant, they actually turn it into either an oil or an isolate. An isolate is actually a powder form. And then those oils and isolates are actually used in the creams and the waters and the oils and the tinctures. So essentially the farmer has not a lot of time, right, after farming and extracting the product to actually get out and market their product. And what's happening in the, spa in the cannabis space is the folks that are in between are brokers, I guess you'd say. And I'm finding that it's, they're not very efficient. So this is why Hemp Hut became available to the, the industry, if you will. And what we're going to do is essentially break that uh, barrier and that problem that's happening between the farmer and the end user, be it the dispensary and or a person that's just wanting to buy the product direct from the farm. So we're giving the consumer a, a, a different option here that's not available to them. So do you have a uh, storefront or is it just you, you get the oil from the, uh, the farmer and then you contract with a retail store? So do you actually have a physical retail store yourself? No, we don't actually do it at all. <clears throat> we, we, just, we, we rely uh, on the product from the farmer. And then we, like I said, the isolates and the, uh, the oils are what we utilize for, uh, for the dispensaries that are making their own product and or the brands out there that are making their or, our own product. All of our uh, products that we are deriving from each of these farms are all organic. And we like to stay in the local area. We don't really like to branch out too far from where they are. Uh, so it's got that uh, ta uh, that table to farm or farm to table type of mentality, and folks are really enjoying that part of it. Mm -hmm. And people like <clears throat> local products. Now, again, for some of the listeners out there, and I'm learning about this process, all the process, the difference between CBD and the THC. Everybody, you know, we've kind of been indoctrinated uh, that anything associated with cannabis or hemp. Um, we're all going to get high and get crazy and weird. So let's kind of break it down a little bit between what is CBD and what are the benefits and then what is the THC that we hear about also? Okay, so t uh, CBD <clears throat> stands for cannabinoid, and there's literally over 70 different types of cannabinoid. We really don't have enough time here to go over each of them. Uh, THC is the um, psychoactive uh, properties those are that's the side that gets you the the high or the euphoric so that yes they're they're totally separate but actually uh, using them together has a lot of uh, people are getting a lot of great results uh, whenever you do like a one for one ratio of CBD and THC uh, people that have um, inflammation or joint pain and things of that nature that seems to be a great ratio for them but everybody's different and again back to these 70 different types of cannabinoids uh, because everybody is so different, you have to find the right ratios for you. And so that, that's probably going to be in development for about another decade. You know, this is still all very brand new to the whole world. Uh, they're just getting great results from the ratios that they're finding now. But you'll find in the future as uh, science starts to break it down more that they'll, there'll be more ways of, uh, there'll be more benefits and stuff. But the, right now, the pain relief is a big one. Um, anxiety, even depression and things of that nature are being treated with CBD oils and and tinctures. So 
the CBD is, from my understanding, the CBD is the uh, one that has the health properties. That people can consume it by eating a cookie or a brownie, or they can rub it on their skin with an oil. Right. Um, the THC then, if, if you just if you're not really looking for the health benefits, but you're looking to get high, it's you focus on the THC aspect of it, correct? Right, right. So they're really uh, they work together, but they're also utilized separately. And so people are using them for different reasons now, separately. And as well, yeah. When they do the extraction, are they taking uh, the THC and the CBD apart? Or so is it- actually the CBD plant is, is uh, totally different than the THC plant. Uh, they look similar. One's a, got a different uh, hue and color. Uh, but actually, they're a different plant, so they're, they're like cousins. Uh, you can't really, you can merge them together. Some folks do make strands that have the CBD and THC together, but it's not real common. What's real common is just to have the CBD plant grow by itself, and so you can get a pure cannabinoid product in the end when you extract it. Um, and the THC side, same thing. That plant uh, provides, you know, 99% of THC in, in this plant, but they're separate plants. Well, that's something I didn't yeah. know. I, I thought... Again, I'm not really that. Uh, uh, I never used any weed when I was in college, uh, you know, 40 some years ago. So I'm getting uh, indoctrinated a little bit about uh, on the business side what cannabis is all about. But I never really knew that they were two separate plants. So yeah. you, you're saying that there's a plant that just has a CBD health properties, mm-hmm. and that plant does not have any THC in it. Correct. And then there's one that has THC, and that's you know is the one that gets you high. So. Correct. And that really doesn't have the health properties. Of- no, they, like I said before, they they together they work well for healing properties and different things. For example, this is probably something that you don't know that uh, President Jimmy Carter he had some brain tumors, and they gave him CBD oil, and within a month his tumors disappeared. So it's it's aggressive on cancer tumors and things of that nature. Um, but some of his some of the ratios, like I was telling you before, CBD ratio one. THC ratio one one to one sometimes helps for other things like inflammation, pain relief, and things of that nature. So uh, there's a lot of different variables on the table now. So again, it's still everybody's still experimenting on what's going to work best for what individual. But uh, CBD and THC can come together, or they can be totally separate. The isolates and the oils that I get from my uh, farms are 99% pure cannabinoid, CBD. So there's no THC whatsoever. So this allows me to uh, go across state lines with product if I want. Uh, THC, you cannot do that yet. Uh, for example, in the state of California, if you have a THC crop, it has to stay within the state of California. It cannot cross into Oregon. Yeah, interesting. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, approaching the farmers, what, what have been some of the challenges that you face in you know, discussing with them what you your service is all about and how you could benefit them. Are, are they uh, accepting your business proposition, or are they kind of just looking at you with a jaundiced eye and saying, "Yeah, what is this guy all about?" And yeah, absolutely I mean, not. So you, that's a great <clears throat> question. So what you have out there is that you have to understand this is interesting. These farmers, because for a lot of them, I find a lot of these guys have been growing for thirty years. Okay, so for thirty years, it wasn't legal, right? So there is this mantra, there's this, uh, there's this paranoia of like, who am I talking to and who can get me in trouble? And, who, so, and, it's, and it's not going away. So you can't really just roll up to a farmer and say, hey, I'm a hemp hut and I'd like to, you know, take your product to the world. They just, they're not that receptive. You need to have some sort of relationship. In my case, I was, I'm an insurance broker. So I was insuring a lot of these guys, getting them quotes. So I had a little bit of an in, but even then they weren't really, they were really reluctant to talk to me. They wanted to, you know, just basically... Uh, share with me what they were up to, but it was limited information I found everywhere I went. So I went to this MJ BizCon in Vegas, and this year they had it in New Orleans. Uh, but even there, where they have a booth, where they're advertising their product, you go in and you talk to them, and they're just sort of limited on what they want to tell you. And a lot of it has to do with the THC CBD issue, meaning if you're here in California and you're growing THC crops, uh, you know, you have certain limitations on what you can grow and certain rules and regulations in certain cities on how many plants you can have and things of this nature. So again, they're limited as to who they're talking to, because if in case you're a federal agent coming up <laughs> wanting to talk to them, they're you're really speaking to the microphone. To yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they're reluctant they do their homework and stuff. It's a, it's a process to uh, uh, have relationships with these guys. But once you do what I've, what I've found is that they're really receptive. They want to help each other. They uh, want to, 
show the other guys how they're doing it, how their success came from the ground up, and and uh, well, so they don't mind sharing their they don't mind stories. Oh, they okay. don't mind once you get past this barrier. Yeah, like once you get into the good old boy network. Then they're, they're willing to talk with you, share with you, and see how they can help you get to your next level and whatnot. So they're really receptive, but in the beginning, it's kind of difficult. But do they see, do the farmers uh, see a benefit to using a service like yours, a kind of, you know, an in-between in person to getting their product? Because like you said, they're, they want to spend their time on farming and, you know, and t- kind of getting that down to a, a, a better science. So do they see your service as something they really need and want? I would go as far as to say yes, but at the same time, again, back to their reluctancy to actually uh, associate with anybody providing the service. This is what's provided a lot of these brokers in between. And what happens to a lot of individuals, and this will never happen to our company, but what happens to a lot of companies is once they get in a relationship going with a farmer, then they want to go have it with another farmer and they want to go have it with another farmer. And then they just start going all over the page. And so certain farms will get neglected. You have to understand farming is such a a tedious process that whenever you get to your cultivation in the end, you have a certain amount of product. And to keep that product fresh and to get it out properly and on time, you want to have the right people that are going to be able to distribute it. But if you become a broker that's going all over the country and you're going in between which is happening in this space, then you know, you're, you're not committing to a, a, an X amount of, of product that you committed to that farmer, and now you're doing it somewhere else, and that farmer's left with extra product that he didn't normally have. So to answer, yes, they're receptive, but, that, but at the same time, they're very selective on who they utilize uh, their business and who they, whose service they use. And, and mention again the, uh, the three states that your company is working in. Uh, you mentioned, I think, California, and what are the other two? California, Oregon, and Colorado. Okay. And let's talk about Colorado because what's interesting about Colorado, I find, is that Colorado is way ahead of us. They're way ahead of every other state. Uh, And what's happening, again, unless you have a good relationship with an ex-farmer in Colorado, uh, these, these trade secrets, if you want to call them that, that are happening here in California, they're having to figure out. So I was talking to the California, uh, the Colorado people that have been doing this about five to seven years earlier than everybody else, particularly the the California people who just started this year. And the California folks are making the same exact mistakes on branding, on labeling, on advertising. And, but the, you know, the Colorado folks are sitting back and laughing a little bit, (laughs) but at the same time they're, they're realizing this is just how each state is going to have to go about it. They are just going to learn themselves. But so with the branding companies, the advertising companies, those are the guys that are really coming up in this space because they're actually being utilized and effect, and they're, they're effectively um, getting results from their, from their advertising. So that's just a unique place. It's a different business right now, but uh, it's worked out really well. It's, um, well, let me ask, uh, how, did, how did you get into this space? I know you mentioned you're in the insurance business, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in a second, but what... Uh, you know, what made you think about getting into this particular business that you're in now? Um, did you find that there was a need for, a, you know, aside from being a broker, you, you know, you don't like that term, but did you find that there was a need for somebody like you to fill this space and then you did some research? Or how did you come up on the idea of, of getting in this? Yeah, area? it really was. The, it was the process of quoting for the, for the uh, farmers and the dispensaries out there. I found that there was this big gap, and I, I heard a lot of complaining, and I sort of, sort of heard of, um, inefficiencies financially on how the money was coming in and how it was be, you know being utilized, and I saw and, and the more more conventions I went to, the more people I talked to, I realized that uh, a lot of these farms are privatized and like you just mentioned, the farmers don't have a lot of time. I mean, it takes a lot of time to do their crop, and now that they're taking on the job of extracting it as well, right there on on site, there's just not a lot of time to do the rest. So uh, I saw it as an opportunity to, um, to help, one. And, and two, I really love the idea of being a part of something that was making a difference. Uh, there's, like, a lot of the CBD is replacing uh, a lot of the opiates that uh, people are taking, <clears throat> folks that have PTSD and things of that nature, uh, the Oxycontins and the Valiums and things, the synthetic drugs out there that people are having problems with. I saw uh, the CBD... Uh, products coming in and making a difference so it's nice to have a business that uh, not only is profitable and and um, interesting um, but it's also something that's helping people 
And it's, it's, th that transition is happening slowly but surely. But people are starting to realize that this plant isn't just something to get high on. It's actually a healer. It's something, it, is, it is a form of, of, of medicine. And the more that we talk about it and, and point, point that out and realize that it's, uh, it's a great healer, you're going to start seeing more people consume CBD. Yeah, and no, I think, I think uh, from what I hear on the news and, and the, the reading I've been doing is a lot of seniors, the baby boomers, you know, which <laughs> I'm, I'm part of that crowd now, um, are finding you know the, the CBD portion of it uh, beneficial to them instead of taking so many prescription drugs. You know, they're, they'd rather take a natural product, and, they're, and they're, they're not really being, you know, brainwashed by, you know, a certain segment out there is saying, you know, that all, uh, you know, cannabis products are bad for you. They're doing their own research and finding out that CBD is a lifestyle, and, yeah. and it can add to their lifestyle as far as reducing stress. And I, I think uh, you and I were talking before the show started that you had some insights about, uh, you know, reducing stress by using some of the CBD oil. We'll cover that again. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a stress reliever, uh, anxiety reliever. Uh, again, I said it's sort of an antidepressant. Folks that are experiencing depression are uh, taking CBD, and they're finding a great calming effect of it. And, and it's not like anything else out there. Uh, for example, I don't know, you know, like a shot of tequila. I like tequila, you know, I take a <laughs> shot of tequila. The Comisario is really good, by the way. And, but that's on a, on a, after a long day, you take one or two shots. It's a, it's, a, it's a stress reliever. But guess what? It's also impaired me to drive now. And in some cases to speak, I'm a lightweight. So I, 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 if I take a couple of shots and people call me, they're like, have you been drinking? Yeah, I have. I've had a couple of shots. <laughs> And so it's, it, CBD doesn't do that to you. You take a couple drops of the oils, for example, under your tongue. I think I shared this story with you about, about my mom. I'll share it with you now. Um, people, my, my buddy thought I was crazy. You're giving your mother cannabis? What are you, nuts? And no. I, she was actually doing her own research, and she actually asked for it. And so I gave her a couple drops. And I got my mom this gym membership, and she works out now, and she's doing a lot of neat things for herself. But she says, Tony, you know, I'm a little low in energy. She's in her 70s. And I says, okay, well, why don't you take a couple of these drops before you go to the gym? She goes, okay. She takes a couple drops. She gets on the treadmill. She's not a real, you know, aggressive person at the gym or whatnot. But she goes and she does her workout. She comes back from this workout and she calls me up. She says, Tony, I'm going to need a bottle of that CBD oil. Why? What's going on? <laughs> she says, it gives me energy. She says, it gives you energy, right? She says, yeah, I'm getting energy off of this. And not, she said, I did experience a little bit of the calming you were telling me about, but this gives me energy as well. So I'd like to take it before I go to the gym every day. And I says, okay, great. So there's, there's stories like that all the time about people that try it the first time for whatever reason. If they're having knee pain or, you know, joint pain or whatnot, or if they're having inflammation or whatever. It doesn't matter what age you are. The oil or the, they have their CBD waters out now or these isolates, again, the creams and things of that nature. People are trying it and they're getting results. Yeah, and it, uh, a lot of the mainstream uh Drugstores are carrying the products. I think Walgreens is carrying them, and uh, you know CVS starts carrying some of the products. Right. So it's becoming more and more acceptable in you know the mainstream uh, stores, or you know the seniors shop, and everybody else happens to shop also. You're listening to Business Pulse Talk Radio, the heartbeat of business, and I'm your host Michael Brett. I have a guest with me today, Tony Nick, uh, and he's got a business called Hemp Hub, and uh, he helps the uh, the hemp farmers get their product because the farmers want to concentrate on growing the product and extracting the oils, and they need to get that to market. So Tony's company actually helps the farmer get that product into mainstream and, and down to the consumers. And let's talk about, you mentioned that you got into this business kind of through the back door of insurance. Let's mm -hmm. talk about that. For, you're a licensed insurance agent, broker. Right. Right. Now, what kind of insurance uh, policies or you know, do, uh, you know, the hemp farmers and, you know, cannabis companies need or should, should be looking at uh, in this environment? So the farmers, the farmers themselves need to get insurance on their product. Like in Napa Valley last year, they had those big fires, wiped out millions of dollars of crops. Insurance wasn't even available back then. So now it's available. So you get a general liability policy that covers that the value of that crop. So those folks now can now get a policy that allows them to be covered in the case of a fire like that. Um, the extraction machines, which is really strange, but you cannot lease this equipment. They started around seven or eight hundred thousand dollars. So these guys have to pay full price 
for this equipment. You have to buy it. You can't you have, lease. You no, know, you have to buy. It. You cannot lease. It's the strangest thing. And again, I don't I really don't understand why that is. I've never really bothered to ask. But I, every guy that I've talked to about it, they're like, yeah, I had to buy it and I had to pay full price for it. There's a guy out in San Diego. My uh, my CBD guy there has nine different uh, extracting machines. He paid a million dollars each for those, and so. They're not cheap, um, but that's that's the process. The, that they're, they're, the farmer is taking um, that unit and extracting their product with it, but they had no insurance up until this time. So now it's available. Before there was like two or three carriers that were carrying it. Now you have a couple dozen that are you know making it affordable. They're bringing the prices down. But as I told you before, you know what's happening is these guys are so used to not paying insurance. <laughs> Once they find out how much it is, I found that yeah, they're like, uh, I've been fine without it so far. So yeah. let's, you know, so it's a tough uh, sort of sale. But anyway, the the, the point is, is that the the policies are available for them now, and the farms and the dispensers will start to uh, insure their products so that they don't, you know, have any damage or whatnot. But I'm finding that a lot of them just were pretty comfortable without having any insurance. Now I'm sure you know you've uh, been you know watching the news and the financial news, reading the Wall Street Journal. Uh, a lot of cannabis companies are going public, yes. either in Canada or getting a listing here in the United States on Nasdaq. There's been a lot of buzz in the media about you know taking companies public in the cannabis space, mm -hmm. and a lot of them, uh, have been have done reverse mergers. You know, going into a shell from a private company to a public vehicle, um, and I know you have experience with that, and yeah. and uh, I think you have a shell available. And give us a little bit of background. Sure, on that. absolutely. So, um, Hemp Hub's future will it's a really good chance it will be be publicly traded. Um, and again, back to these conventions, we found that um, there's a big gap in between the folks that uh, were considering going public versus now they are like you know because wall street was sort of a, a scary place for i think a lot of these companies again because of the thc side of it it's not legal nationwide yet but once cbd became nationwide you know you could legally take those products across state lines through that farm bill that was passed not too long ago it, yeah it was in january when yeah. they this our, our current administration took care of that so now those folks are starting to realize wow wall street could really help us we could get some capital from a public company being exposed now isn't going to cause us any trouble we can cross state lines we're not going to be breaking any laws so now they're starting to realize that that, that uh, the cannabis space is starting to realize that that the capital and the and the relationships they can have on being public are, are fantastic so yes we've we've been approached and yes we've acquired a couple of public companies and we'll either consider uh, utilizing those or we'll uh, you know, use them as assets for some of these other folks that, that are a little bit farther along than we are. Uh, but it, we've been educating a lot of people on the process of a reverse merger and or going straight through a re registration process. And uh, you better believe it that there are literally hundreds of millions of dollars in funds on the sidelines just wanting to do anything related to cannabis because they're seeing the money that these guys are making. Mm -hmm. and coupled with, like I said before, it's a, it's a good thing. It's helping people's health and it's proven to continue to do so. Why don't you give give your telephone number out, uh, the, the best contact number for you, in case the listeners want to get in touch with you and uh, find out more about your business. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, it's area code 619-248-4450. It's my direct line. Tony's my name. I'll just answer directly and uh, answer any questions you may have. And if you're an interested investor by chance, uh, we could definitely maybe have some neat conversations there. And then you have an Instagram, a lot of information on Instagram right yeah, Instagram has right is, is been hot for us. Uh, it's incredible how many people have contacted us there. It's, it's mind-boggling, actually. Uh, uh, Hemp Hut San Diego is our name there. And uh, let me spell it for you, H-E-M-P-H-U-T-S-A-N-D-I-E-G-O, Hemp Hut San Diego. Excellent. So you can go there anytime, and we'll definitely uh, make contact with you there. Good. And you're listening to Business Pulse, the heartbeat of business. I'm your host, Michael Brett. And we've had uh, a great conversation today with Tony Nick uh, talking about cannabis, hemp, CBD, THC, and helping some of the farmers out to get their product uh, to market. We're going to have more shows. Tony's going to come back on the show again next month uh, and kind of give us an update on uh, where he's at with his business. And we're going to have other experts coming on from Shark Tank and uh, just jam-packed with telling you how to start a business, how to grow a business, how to find investors, how to take your company public, how to get a proper valuation for your business, why you should be concerned about evaluation. Just a lot of things uh, on this show, Business Pulse. It's all about business all the time. I want to thank everybody for listening. 
I'm your host, Michael Brett. We'll see you next Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific.